Hey friends, it's Easter week, the best week of the year because God's creative power and compelling love is on display so the world will know that he is God. And friends, I think it's time to shout out hallelujahs instead of whispering them. That we should light every candle in our homes instead of only some. That in fact, we should give every man, woman, child, dog, cat, and mouse a candle to hold. That we should light a magnificent bonfire and even splash water about as we celebrate baptism to new life because Jesus is not dead, he is alive. And today is Palm Sunday. And we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And today, Pastor Zach will bring the message entitled, Courage, Jesus Did Go Up. And also know that there is no resurrection without crucifixion. So on Thursday, I will bring the message about determination. Jesus didn't give up. And then Easter comes, Resurrection Day, and Jesus does rise up taking us on a journey from death to life. And that's why it's the best week of the year. So I have a request. Will you RSVP your Easter service choice to ensure that we have a place and space for every person to be welcomed? And if you're able, attend the Saturday Easter services to make room on Sunday for guests. It's easy. Just go to our website, noting the campus and the time. One last word, it's a word of gratitude. Thank you for the great celebration last week as we wrapped up Nehemiah and our Love Builds two-year generosity initiative to accelerate our here, near, far vision. God is on the move. And thanks to all of you who have already given your commitment pledges. And if you haven't already done so, please do so over the next week because we're going to communicate the results the Sunday after Easter. You wanna be there for that celebration as well. But now, it's Palm Sunday. Would you join me in welcoming Pastor Zach Bush, who brings today's message. Well, hey, good morning and welcome everyone to those joining us here, those joining us at Bush Lake and online. It's so good to be together. As Pastor Joel mentioned, my name is Zach and I have the joy of serving here as one of the pastors on staff. And today is an exciting day as we celebrate Palm Sunday. But before we dive into the message, I just wanna take a brief moment to acknowledge some of the events that occurred this last week. And uh, as many of you are aware, uh, we once again in our country experienced another school shooting, and I hate saying that word again, uh, because we continue to see uh, these events unfold right in front of our eyes. And it's just a reminder to us of why we celebrate Prom Sunday, that Jesus came once, and we take hope that he will come again to make all the brokenness brand new. And so will you just join me? I think it's, it's fitting for us to just begin our time and a moment of uniting our hearts in prayer. So for all of us here online at Bush Lake and West Tonka, let's unite our hearts as we join up in prayer. Let's pray together, friends. Gracious Father, we thank you so much that you sent your son Jesus, that he lived a perfect life, and that he came to bring hope. And we get a foretaste of that hope here today, but Lord, we look forward to a time whenever we will see and experience that in deeper and more full ways. And so Lord, we give you the family members of those who are impacted by this tragedy, the three young children, the three staff members. God, won't you blanket their family with your peace, with your love, with your provision? And won't you help us to remember their beautiful smiles and their memories? And Lord, for the officers who rushed headfirst into the conflict, knowing the danger that was before them with their bravery and courage, we thank you. And we ask, Lord, that you will protect their hearts and their minds each day, week, and month moving forward. God, we give you this Nashville community and all the families impacted. We look forward to a time, Jesus, when you will take the brokenness and make it brand new. So as we say today, come, Lord Jesus, come. Won't you save us? We pray this in the beautiful, powerful, matchless name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, it is Palm Sunday, a day in which we celebrate the triumphant entry of Jesus to Jerusalem. And today is also a special day because it is a day in which we celebrate the one year birthday of our Westwood West Tonka campus. I didn't give you a shout out Westwood West Tonka, but we are so grateful for you. Can we give it up for Westwood West Tonka? 
It's been amazing to see the last year plus of the journey that they have been on. And as I think about Westwood, West Tonka, I'm mindful uh, that it was about this time several years ago, back in 2020, when we were planning to host preview services for Palm Sunday and Easter in the Mountain West Tonka area. But many of you, hopefully you recall and you remember something that happened in 2020. Yeah, this little thing called COVID put a massive pause on the movement out there. However, the team there continue to come forward with boldness and courage saying, we wanna see the presence of Jesus embodied through the local church of Westwood here. And so that campus, that community has been faithful week in and week out, uh, courageously loving on their community, courageously loving, showing up at 6 a.m. on Sunday mornings to build, uh, to, to set up and to tear down our campus there and, and courageously loving on those around them by inviting them to church. It's been really this amazing time of courageous love. And when we think about courageous love, we we know that those two things go hand in hand together, courage and love. And and I think a lot of times that uh, we wanna pull those apart because I think for some of us, there is at times a fear to love. In fact, I was reading in the last several weeks an article published out that used some of these statistics and some of these reasonings for why people are afraid to love others. And maybe some of these really resonate with you. This article suggested that people are afraid to love for a variety of reasons. For some, they're afraid that loving means inviting proximity for people, that whenever we invite people into our lives, we're nervous and afraid because they might see our brokenness and they might see our baggage. For others of us, we're afraid to love because we know that by inviting somebody close to us, that could result in betrayal or abandonment. We could be wounded by that. It could mean rejection as well. Or for others, we are fearful to love because we know that love necessitates sacrifice. And so it takes courage to love. And that's what we celebrate today in Palm Sunday. We see courageous love in Jesus's person and in his work. We see that he went to Jerusalem knowing full that he would be rejected, that he would be betrayed, that he would be wounded. And yes, there would ultimately be a sacrifice on display for us. And so what I want us to look at today is this one question. What is the picture of courageous love? Uh, What is the picture of courageous love shown in the person and the work of Jesus Christ that will prepare our hearts well for this Holy Week? Well, today we're gonna be digging into John chapter 12, verses nine through 15. It's gonna be the triumphal entry of Jesus moving into Jerusalem. And as we look at John chapter 12, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a roadmap. Okay, we're gonna have two key points, two key movements. And those movements go as follows. First of all, we're gonna see a response then. Okay, so we're a response from the time of Jesus, seeing how people respond to his triumphal entry. But we're not just gonna leave it then, we're gonna move it now. The second point that we'll see is an invitation now, an invitation for you and for me that we can step into this day and this week called Holy Week. So a response then in Jesus' time and an invitation now for each and every one of us. Well, let's dive in to John chapter 12, verse nine and following to see Jesus' triumphal entry. Here are the words here. It says this, when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there. Now really quick, they're there. He was in Bethany, which is right outside Jerusalem. Uh, They came not only account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast, they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And so they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him, crying out these words, Hosanna, or, you know, if you're from the South, it's Hosanna, but if you're from the North, Hosanna, all right? Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And then here's Jesus's response. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. He said this, fear not. You can see this undercurrent of fear throughout our message. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And so whenever we look at this passage, once again, we'll come to this first idea of a response 
then. Uh, We can see that there is a response to Jesus and his triumphal entry. But when I think about a response, you know, I think just kind of big picture that you can tell a lot about a person based on how they respond or based on how they react to certain things in life. Uh, You know, how do people respond whenever unexpected news hits? How do people react uh, whenever crisis arises? Or how do people respond whenever Jesus kind of moves close and and provides these, these promptings that we have in life? And so really a big idea or an anchoring statement that we'll hold on to today is this. Talking about a response. The character of your response reveals the content of your heart. Okay, the the character of your response, let me put it this way. The way that you respond, the character of your response reveals the content, uh, the, the things that take up occupancy in your heart and in your life. And so let's think about this really quickly. How do you respond in certain situations? How do you respond, for example, when you come across traffic? Ooh, Lord have mercy. All right, are you responding with impatience and frustration? Okay, how about this one? How do you respond when your kids aren't listening? All right, do you, do you kind of just like, Ugh, do you kind of get frustrated a little bit? Or how do you respond whenever a coworker drops the ball? Do you respond by berating and belittling them? Or how about this? How do you respond when you drop the ball? Do you feel guilt? Do you feel shame? Do you kind of go internal? How do you respond when Jesus moves close and he gives us God promptings? Do you reject him or do you welcome him? You see, the character of your response reveals the content of your heart. And so we'll be unpacking that uh, in these different responses that we see in Jesus' time. We'll see three different responses. The chief priests and their response, uh, uh, Lazarus' response, and also the crowd's response. But let's dive in. Let's look very at the first point, which is the, the, the chief priests and their response. And now at this time, Whenever we look at Jerusalem, it's known that uh, there are a lot of people coming into Jerusalem for this religious Passover festival. In fact, Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, he said that at this time, it's believed that there could have been north of a million people coming into this uh, really, really small ancient city, uh, that the population had really swelled and maximized at this time. And so you can just imagine, whenever you hear the word large crowd, it meant large crowd, like a massive crowd. And the chief priests were there watching this large crowd leave them and go to Jesus. Let's look at these words, calling back to here. It says this, when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And here's the chief priest's response. So the chief priest made plans. You now begin to see their response unfolding. They made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, here it is, Many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Okay, just just think about this for a second. These are supposed to be the leaders. These are supposed to be the ones that God had entrusted to shepherd and to lead his people. And now all of a sudden, this crowd is, is leaving and abandoning them. You can begin to see their response. Okay, what is their response? What is the, the constant of their heart? They began to make plans. Their response was premeditated murder. And unfortunately, it's not just murder against Jesus because as I really began to dig into this passage over the last several weeks, there was one little phrase that jumped out at me that I had never seen before. And it's two words, and it's the words, as well. You're like, well, what about as well? Oh, well, they said, hey, we're gonna put Jesus to death and we're gonna put Lazarus to death as well. And I think about that, it's like, man, what did Lazarus do to you guys, Right? I mean, just think about this. I I could just imagine whenever they're sitting there making plans, they're probably huddling up together and they're like, okay, you know, hey, we're we're seeing the crowds leave and abandon us. We need to put Jesus to death. And they're like, yeah. And then somebody else is like, yeah. And and we also need to put Lazarus to death. And the rest of the crowd's like, yeah, as the echo chamber and the the reverberations are going around. And then they're just kind of sitting there quietly. And they're like, maybe somebody else chimes in and says, well, what did Lazarus do to us? And then somebody just responds, for breathing, right? It's like they had no reason to kill Lazarus. And yet the the content of their heart revealed to us the the character of their response, which was an action that would have ripple effects into the city all around them. The content of their heart was one of power, control, and fear, and intimidation. 
And when Jesus steps in as a new influencer into the city of Jerusalem, now all of a sudden their response is, we need to kill him. And we need to kill everyone who has come into close association with. It it is completely uh, erratic and frantic in their response. But you can imagine uh, that is the seatbed of their identity, that they valued status and symbol. They powered over, but we see Jesus doesn't power over. No, 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 Jesus powers under. Mark 10, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom to many. And so that's the chief priest. And you can see their response. But, but next we move on and we see Lazarus's response. And I really appreciate this because I'd never really quite noticed this before. But you can begin to un- understand and unpack that, that Lazarus was right there with Jesus. And we have to look at the context of of John chapter 12. Okay, well, what is the the chapter that comes before chapter 12? Chapter 11. Thank you so much, Texas High School Public Education for that. (laughs) But John chapter 11 gives us this picture of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And there is one important verse within that chapter. Now, just a quick word, okay? You know, a lot of times as pastors, we want to invite you to memorize scripture, Okay, because whenever we begin to memorize and set our minds on scripture, right, we can begin to recall certain verses that are important for us. And some of you are like, man, you know, memorizing scripture is really hard. I get it. But I'm going to give you a verse from John chapter 11 that I hope and pray you can memorize. Okay, it's perhaps one of the shortest verses in the New Testament. You ready for it? John 11:35. 35. Jesus wept. Do you think you can memorize that one? Right, so tomorrow you can go to work, you can tell your kiddos, it's like, hey, I memorized scripture, Jesus wept. All right, if you can't memorize that, let's talk afterwards, I'll, I'll help you out with it. But why is that verse important? Because it showed the friendship that Jesus and Lazarus shared with one another. It, it showed that they were in close bond of affection and they had proximity to one another, that when Lazarus died, Jesus wept. Jesus says, this is not how things were supposed to be. Death is not supposed to be here. And so Jesus begins to give us a little foretaste of what hope looks like by raising his friend Lazarus from the grave. Now, let me ask you this. What would you do if someone raised you from the dead? Right? I, I, would, I personally would cling closely to that person. I would cling closely to Jesus if he did that for me. And we can see that here because whenever it said that the crowds went out to see Jesus, they also saw Lazarus as well. And when they went out to see Lazarus, they also saw Jesus as well. There was a closeness and there was a proximity between Jesus and Lazarus. And I think it's helpful because you can just imagine, word probably spread, did it not? I mean, this is the guy that Jesus raised from the dead. So don't you think maybe there, was, there might've been some nerves filling Lazarus's heart and his mind? Don't you think maybe he's kind of looking over his shoulder? He's like, what's going to come next? And yet, despite that, what we know to be true in this passage is he shared close proximity to Jesus. That was what his response was. And that close proximity, it gave Lazarus this amazing, beautiful steadiness and peace for whatever it was that was thrown his way. And man, when I think about that, it's like, God, I want that peace. I want that steadiness that Lazarus has here in this passage. And here's the thing, as a pastor, I want that peace. I want that steadiness for each and every one of you too. The peace only comes from proximity to Jesus. It only comes from being in close fellowship with him. That's Lazarus's response. And then we move finally to the the crowd's response. We we begin to see and unpack how the crowd uh, approached Jesus. And and what I love about it is it really begins to show us that uh, the day before, it says that the crowd came to him and he was in Bethany. Uh, Verse nine talks about that. But then in verse 12, it says the very next day, the crowd came again. So it's this idea that the crowd went not just once, but they kept coming back again and again. Look at verse 12. It says these words, the next day, the large crowd, so you can just imagine this massive crowd that had come to the feast, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And so they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him. Oh, okay, they had these palm branches and they were meeting Jesus and they were going out to to greet him. They, They kept going back time and time and time again because Jesus was attractive to them. Jesus was invitational. And they said, we're gonna keep coming back because we know that there might be something different about this guy. And so then they continue along and they say these words. So they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Hosanna means God, won't you save? 
Once you save even today, and they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And so there's something important here that we have to unpack that the crowd didn't necessarily have a full view of who Jesus was at this time, but their curiosity drove them to keep coming back again and again. So the question is this then, why the palm branches? Right, do you ever wonder about that? Why the palm branches? Can, can we do a quick hickory, history lesson? I almost said hickory lesson. We could do a hickory lesson, but it's not gonna be very rich in content. Let's do a history lesson. Why the palm branches? Well, the palm branches were really symbolized at this time uh, when a city would go out to meet a returning king who was coming back from, from conquest. They would go out and they'd meet this king in the field side, in the countryside, and then they'd welcome this king back into the city. And the palm branches really helped to signify almost this national identity for the nation of Israel. And at this time, the nation of Israel was living as an autonomous state under the rule of the Greco-Roman world. The Greco-Roman world, world really ruled with kind of a hard fist and they would tax the, the nation of Israel and, and they would uh, continue to pressure them. Uh, well, about 150 to 180 years before Jesus, there was what historians called the Maccabean Revolt. Uh, this is what initiated Hanukkah for the Jewish people. And there's a guy by the name of Judas Maccabee who raised up a revolt against the Greco-Roman rulers at that time to cleanse the temple and to push them back. And the people of the city met Judas Maccabee waving palm branches, thinking maybe this is the Messiah, maybe this is the one. And so what we can see here is the crowd had just been waiting for generations, hoping that there would be somebody who would bring something new because they were dissatisfied with the way that they were living and the things that they were experiencing right here and right now. And so what if we think about the crowd Oh, we can see their response bringing out palm branches, but within their heart, they long for, they desire for something greater. And they kept coming back to Jesus again and again and again. And so if we were to, to line up these three different responses, uh, what we could ultimately say is within the chief priest, um, the things that filled their heart was power, control, identity, status, symbol, that ultimately responded and premeditated murder that would have wreaked havoc and destruction on those all around them. Uh, we can see that in Lazarus, that he had a, a response of steadiness and proximity to Jesus. And the reason for that, I believe, is because the things that were deposited into his heart was that his identity was this, he was a beloved son of God. And then when we look at the crowd, we see their response. They kept going to Jesus again and again and again. And I think the things that filled their heart, it was a hope-filled curiosity. I love that, a hope-filled curiosity for something greater that can only be found in the person and work of Jesus. And so that's the response that we see then. But now I wanna turn our attention to the second movement, which is the invitation now. Uh, what is the invitation now? Well, if we go back and we say that phrase again, the character of your response reveals the content of your heart. We can't just focus uh, on the character of our response. We can't just focus on the external actions. No, we have to get upstream. We have to go further upstream to say, uh, what is it that's being deposited into our heart? And so I just wanna ask you one question, one reflection question for yourself. And that question is this. What is pouring into your heart? Okay, what's pouring into your heart today? Uh, input influences output. And so the things that we are filling our hearts with will ultimately impact our response. It'll impact our output in life. And so is the things that, that are pouring into your heart, is it similar to the chief priests? Is it this desire for power and for control because then our response, whenever we're pressed in, it's gonna be a response of anger and frustration and really franticness. Are you allowing the voices and the noise of this world to fill and to pour into your heart? Because if we allow that to happen, guess what? We're gonna pull back from others and we're gonna have this dividing wall against us. Do you allow fear to fill and pour into your heart? You see, friends, whatever we allow to pour into our hearts, that's gonna impact our relationships with our spouses, with our kids, with our family, with our neighbors, with our coworkers. So what's pouring into your heart? Is it fear or is it something else? I would assert to you, should it be and could it be the courageous love of Jesus pouring into our hearts? 
And so when we think about this courageous love of Jesus, we see it on display. I mean, you, you think about uh, how, how courage combats fear. And, and I think about how Jesus and, and his perfect divinity, he, he knew what was on the other side of him. He, he knew what was awaiting him in Jerusalem and yet he did it anyways. He went up to Jerusalem. He knew that he would be rejected. He knew that he would be betrayed. He knew that he'd be handed over and crucified. And yet he did it. It's Jesus' courageous love that when poured into our hearts and our lives allows us to walk forward in courageous love as well. And so if we were to use this anchoring statement one more time and really pull this out, we, we would say this, the character of your response reveals the content of your heart. Well, what happens whenever we allow the, the love of Jesus to pour into our hearts? Well, when the love of Jesus pours into and becomes the content of your heart, that's when the character of your response will be courageous love. Uh, let, let me say that one more time. Input impacts output. Whenever we allow the courageous love of Jesus to pour into and to become the content of your heart, that's when the character of your response will be courageous love. We can love, why? Because he first loved us. And so what is courageous love exactly? Uh, what is that picture that we can see? Well, courageous love uh, isn't necessarily standing back at a distance and, and getting on your computer as a keyboard warrior and sending off that crazy text or, or email. Uh, that's not courage. It, it doesn't take courage to do that, but what it does is courage. It, it takes courage to, to move towards somebody, to be in proximity, to look people in the eye. And that's what Jesus did. Okay, courage doesn't mean the absence of fear. You realize this, right? And in fact, courage means action, even in the face of fear a lot of times. It means action despite fear. And so whenever we look throughout scripture, the, the amazing part about it is that scripture is littered with times and verses and instances talking about the antidote of fear. Okay, the, the antidote of fear. What is it exactly? I've got two verses that I wanna give to you. And I'm gonna invite you, see if there is a, a word or a theme that emerges. Okay, the very first verse that we look at, the antidote to fear is this. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and what's that word? Love, Love and self-control. I mean, do you see it? Maybe some of you know this passage. Uh, not a spirit of timidity, not a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and self-control. The, the next verse that we have here, maybe one that's even more familiar, First John. There is no fear in, what's that word? but perfect casts out fear. Is it any coincidence that the first words that Jesus says as he's moving up to Jerusalem, responding to the crowd is fear not because love is here embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. And so think about it. It, it takes courageous love to right the wrongs to move towards somebody. It, it takes courageous love to reconcile that broken marriage or that broken relationship. It takes courageous love to speak words of life and affirmation into a wounded child. Input, input, impacts output. We can love because he first loved us. And we see that on display in Palm Sunday. And so what is the invitation for you today? The invitation, just plain and simple, is this. Abide in the courageous love of Jesus this week. Okay, use that word abide. Remain, dwell in the courageous love of Jesus this week, this day and each day moving forward to Monday, Thursday, and Easter Sunday. You know, for some of us, when we think about what it means to abide in that, in that love, that courageous love of Jesus pouring into our hearts, some of us, we know that we need to turn away from the, the systems and the powers of control in our lives. Uh, like the, the chief priest, we need to release that and say, uh, Holy Spirit, won't you cleanse me? Won't you guide me in my life? Maybe for others of us, it's just saying, you know what? Like the crowd, they, they kept going to Jesus. They, they came to Jesus. They went back to Jesus again and again because they knew that there was something better in the presence of Christ. And when we think about that, we, we have a great opportunity to see that depicted through the waters of baptism next weekend. And baptism, 
is just this amazing picture of, of someone going under the water saying, I am dead to Christ and now they are raised to new life in Christ. And they're saying the old has gone and the new has come. Uh, there is hope in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. And so for some of us here today, you might feel God's prompting. You might be sitting there you're like, yeah, you know what? The way that I've been living, the, the characteristics of my life, I'm ready for a new start. I, I'm ready to release my control and say, Jesus, here I am. I'm with you. I want you to lead and direct in my journey. Or maybe for others of us, the invitation for us today, what it means to abide in the courageous love of Jesus is like that of Lazarus. It's to mean, you know, I'm going to stay in close proximity. I'm going to remain with him. I'm going to hear his words each and every day that you are God's beloved through faith in Jesus Christ. You're going to dwell in his presence because we know that in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. Well, friends, as we wrap up today, you know, I, I think if we were to see a, a giant massive banner depicting to the world Palm Sunday, if there was like a, a word or a phrase coming after Palm Sunday, it would look like this, Palm Sunday, courageous love, he did it. You know, courageous love, he, he went up to Jerusalem even whenever he knew what was before him. And so friends, I need your help to, to wrap up this sermon. I need you to help preach with me. All right, for everyone here at Chan, those online at West Honk and Bush Lake, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you a signal. And when I give you the signal, I want you to respond, he did it. Okay, let's give it a shot. Yeah. Oh man, yeah, that's good. One more time. Yeah. Man, he went up to Jerusalem and, and he did it. You know, even when he knew that he would be betrayed and mocked and ridiculed, yeah. even when he knew that he would be bloodied, beaten and bruised, even when he knew he'd be scourged and crucified to set the prisoner free, to bring peace and prosperity. Friends, may we rest, abide, and dwell in Jesus's courageous love this week because let's stand and worship and pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you so much that you sent your son, Jesus, that he came and he lived a perfect life. He was innocent, he was spotless. He should not have been the one to go up to Jerusalem. And yet, as we just proclaimed, he did it. Knowing what was on the other side, the betrayal, the mocking, the scourging, the crucifixion, he showcased, he depicted to us what courageous love truly is. And so Lord, I pray for all of us here that we're not infatuated with religion, but we're infatuated with the love of God poured into our lives, into our hearts, the love of Jesus Christ. May we abide, may we dwell in that love this week. Lord, won't you prompt us, won't you direct us that as we receive your love, we can release that love to the world around us as we say, Hosanna, Lord, save. And so be honored, be praised in our lives. We pray all this in the beautiful, matchless name of Jesus and by the power of the Spirit and all God's people said,